Welcome to another episode of the Firepreneurs Podcast. We today are continuing on in the financial educational wellness series. This segment is is really tailored to the top five financial mistakes that firefighters commonly make when planning for retirement. We brought on Greg Freeman and Chris Boykley in the series, who we introduced in our intro episode. Um, but one of the episodes that we want to get started with before we dive into those those top five is we've started wanted to start with an eighteen. 25 year old person who is hearing advice about financial, you know, planning and whatever the case may be. And maybe they're a little overwhelmed. So we're thinking about an 18 to 25 year old who's hearing this and they're like, man, where do I even get started with that? And, and so for us, we're just going to kind of unpack like those easy wins, right? Like if you're putting the ladder of climbing that ladder to that financial planning, like this is the first rung on the ladder they're setting their foot on getting really granular and trying to find those tips and tricks that we can kind of just get some of our listeners that momentum for financial planning. So putting ourselves in the shoes of that 18 to 25 year old, that's going to be the subject of the episode. And we're going to let Greg and Chris give us some good feedback there. And, and, you know, so whether this is something that you as a firepreneur are listening to, and maybe you're in that range and can apply or, you know, for me selfishly, uh, own fire dogs, some of my young people that come in the company, I'm gonna have them listen to this episode. I like it. Um, any o- other entrepreneurs out there, I wanted to build this content so that maybe you could give this episode to your troops as well. So that's kind of the aim of the episode. So gentlemen, we were putting ourselves in the shoes of an 18 to 25 year old person, and they don't have any knowledge on financial planning. Where should we start? Where do we start? Yeah, so for most people starting out, there's a a real order that you you should think about things financially. And to your point, there's some kind of groundwork you've got to put in place before we can even think about, you know, making financial mistakes of, you know, saving and investing. Um, And the first thing that comes to my mind is protecting the downside. So you've got to establish an emergency fund. To me, that's like action item number one, where traditional financial planning advice is to have three to six months of your monthly expenses just sitting there in cash. Um, and what that does is say, you know, maybe your AC goes out and your transmission go out in the same month. It prevents you from having to, um, you know, tap into retirement accounts or some of the things that, that you'll put on, put in place later to be able to make ends meet, you know, so that emergency fund, another piece to protecting the downside is having some sort of life insurance in place especially if you've got a family with kids where in Bennett, I'll use you for example, you know, you, if something were to happen to you, your wife and kids aren't going to be like, man, thank God Bennett had this awesome podcast. (laughs) You know, it's really, you know, making ends meet for us now. The thing that's going to matter is that you had some kind of life insurance coverage where, you know, everything that you're going to put in place financially down the road can you know, continue on and your family can keep their quality of life if something were to happen to you. You're right. My kids will actually probably be embarrassed that I had a podcast and <laughs> they're probably just going to make fun of me later in life, which is, you know, pretty cool. So 20 years from now when Trip listens to this, they'll be making fun of me. So yeah, it definitely won't be the podcast, <laughs> but the life insurance is spot on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for any of our firepreneurs, you know, not just life insurance for your, your, whatever the case may be, your mortgage, your your spouse to have extra money. But I think for anybody listening out there who has a business and your business has assets, you need a life insurance policy that will protect. And if, if say, if it's a financed asset, you need to pay that asset off. You need to have enough life insurance to pay that off, maybe pay off the, the, the house and still have money to take care of the family. So like that's personally for me speaking from experience, I have a policy that does that. But yeah, I'm glad you touched on that. What else? And it's certainly not the the fun, you know, sexy side of investing and financial planning, if there is a sexy side to financial planning. (laughs) I think there is, but I might be biased. You might be biased. But it's such a, especially young, you know, you're, you're that firepreneur and you're, you know, in your early twenties, it's just starting out. It is a dirt cheap um, risk to mitigate against Mm -hmm. by putting some sort of, you know, term policy in place, having that emergency fund in place, um, that's definitely step number one in my mind. Yeah, if I were to add in there, I think it's important to understand when you're first getting started that the things that you should put in place are not the fun, fancy, sexy stuff, right? Get your get your ducks in a row, get organized, 
And then most importantly, don't let procrastination stop you from getting started. Save that first dollar. Let compounding interest do what it does. And that's where when I go back and I look at our most successful clients, they all started early Mm. and they stayed consistent and they kept a good discipline and good habits in their financial planning, their savings and, um, you know, good things, good things happen. But just understand when you first get started as a young person, you're not doing the fun, fancy, sexy things like you were saying, you're just getting your ducks in a row. So those things will come down the line. I think back to, uh, so I do, um, mentorship sessions with everybody in the company. And I, so I have a, a lot of these 18, 25 year olds. And, and when they think about like savings and planning, they have, they all have dreams or goals and things they want to accomplish. And, and so I try to go like super granular with a lot of them and say, okay, you want, you want to own a house. What's, what's one of the goals that we can set? And they'll say, I need to save $20,000 or whatever the case. I said, that's fantastic. We need to go deeper than that though. Well, what do you mean? It's like, do you have a savings account? And you'd be, I mean, you'd just be surprised how many people have not created a savings account yet. So some of the advice I end up finding myself giving a lot, and I'm not an expert, um, just for our audience here. So listen to the experts here. But like when I think about our technicians that come in, they may have never heard any, even, even advice about creating a savings account to create an emergency fund. So one of the pieces of advice I find myself giving a lot is let's open up a savings account. Let's make that rung one on the ladder, right? That's goal one. That's rung one on the ladder. Rung two is how much can you afford to automatically transfer from your checking to your savings every pay period? And then they start to click. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to transfer 100 bucks every pay period. I'm like, is that going to sting? Like, no, it'll be fine. I'm like, no, but really, though, can you can you cough up 200, 200 a month right now? And they're like, nah, let's start with something small, like 10 bucks, so that you create that habit-forming behavior. And then that money every two weeks automatically goes in there and then you can always just kick it up a notch like to 25 to 50 to 100 until they build the comfort and then the other piece of advice i find myself giving along that same lines like i call it like rung three and i was like hey how like how likely are you to try and take money out of your savings account like oh man if it's right there because you know how these phones are today it's like you get on your app you can easily just do you want to pay this from your checking or your savings like it's so easy for them to just spend money out of the savings instead of their checking So what I have some of them, the advice I give them is to go and set up a savings account at your bank that you can only withdraw money from if you go there in person. And like, so playing to like the psychology of us as humans, like if you put it on a cell phone, it's easy for us to steal from our own savings accounts. But if I have to go drive there to get money out, then it's like, all right, I won't do that very often, right? Maybe I will just leave it in there for the trip or for the financial planning or for the emergency fund or whatever. So like I get, I find myself giving that advice as far like tips and tricks go pretty commonly is like, I I get them the, that metaphor of the ladder start at that bottom rung. Do you have a savings account? I love, I love that. I, to to even add on to that, you know, sometimes you get these young kids coming in and they want to, they want to do the right thing. Right. But they've never done it before. So they, it's almost like going to the gym and really going balls to the wall Mm -hmm. that first time. And then you're so sore, you don't go back. I would rather you go get good form in the gym and you just consistently are showing up and then you'll build into, you know, probably a good consistent routine at the gym. It's the same way with financial planning. If you go in and you try to save a thousand dollars every month and all of a sudden it's stopping you from doing the things you enjoy and the reason you work to to live life, then all of a sudden you stop doing it and years pass by and then you're going to be the person that we hear all the time that says, I wish I would have started this when I was younger. Right. So build those consistent habits, start small and stay consistent. That's, that's huge. I think about the, the life opportunity of the, you know, maybe it's the new fire dogs, uh, junk removal hire or the new firefighter where your life is so flexible and it is so powerful to put these things in place early, like Greg just mentioned, but I think about the concept of paying yourself first. Mm. So maybe if if you're making, you know, $50,000 a year, our goal for pretty much all of our clients is to save 15 to 20% of your income. You know, 20% of 50 grand is 10,000 bucks. Yep. So that 10,000 bucks is not, you know, for your lifestyle. You know, you've got $40,000 to build your life however you want it. That $10,000 
you're putting to work for you and your future um, and your goals. And that's such a powerful op- opportunity when you're young and just getting started where you can set your life up however you want. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have some clients that have a, a 50% savings rate. They save half of what they earn each year because they've put, you know, they've set their lifestyle up um, where they can do that. Whereas if you, you know, say, hey, I've got 50000 you know, I can afford this house, I can afford this trip or whatever it might be, it's so hard to come back from that compared to just putting it in place where, hey, now I'm making 200000 You know, the small business has really taken off or whatever it might be. You're still saving forty grand. That 20% is still, you know, paying yourself and you're building your lifestyle around the other 160. Yeah, when you, when you start your first job, you don't know the difference between a lifestyle of 50,000 and a lifestyle of 40,000. Kind of like you're saying, right? So save first and then build your lifestyle after you save. It's a lot easier said than done, but it's a lot easier to do right out the gate versus trying to come backwards, like you said. You just build a fifty thousand dollar lifestyle. Now you, how are you supposed to save? Right. That's that. I think that's kind of what you're trying to talk about, right? Yeah. There's a, some kind of interesting behavioral finance stuff where the the level of utility is kind of the the economics term. Uh, that's the, the level of satisfaction you get from increasing your lifestyle from a a fifty thousand dollar lifestyle to a hundred dollar lifestyle isn't proportionate. You don't get double the satisfaction from, you know, having a lifestyle that's twice as expensive. But to try to come back from it, you know, your lifestyle is built around spending every dollar you earn. There's a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of friction to try to pull Mm -hmm. back from that. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity when you're young and getting started out, you know, first getting started um, to, you know, build your lifestyle after you've paid yourself first with that you know, that 15 to 20% of uh, what you're making, you know, being saved and invested. Mm-hmm. Here's, a, here's a good, uh, I'm just messing with this calculator here, the compounding calculator I show a lot of our younger clients. If you save $300 a month for 35 years with compounding interest, you'll actually have $1.1 million at retirement. 300 a month, 35 years with compounding interest as is right now, $1.1 million in retirement. And you only contributed 126000 That's the impact of what compounding interest is. So you actually profited over a million bucks just by starting early. But if you start when you're 15 years from retirement, now you only have $124,000 15 years from now. So, I mean, the compounding interest is massive. So the point being, start early. Start early. You know, I think, too, uh, you, you both touched on something that, I feel like uh, I was reflecting back when I was on active duty. I remember a staff sergeant in the Air Force was, was kind of talking about this. Again, this goes back to our intro episode where I feel like firefighters talk around it. We, we, we talk around it with each other. But we sometimes don't ever you know, have that, that expert advice come in and like help us execute. right? But I, So this is me when I was that 20-year-old. And I was on active duty. I was in Alaska. I was around a staff sergeant. And he gave me a really powerful piece of advice. That it's, I, it stuck with me, and it's kind of my inspiration for wanting to do something like this. Is he said that when he he was married, he had three kids, but he never stopped living off of an um, E four salary. So in the military, E four is a I think a senior airman still, right? So like I remember when I was an airman first class, E E three. I think pay active duty pay was like eighteen thousand five hundred sixty dollars a year. That was my salary. Yeah. It's like it's always funny to me when I have people in my company like. Man, I can't live off of fifty grand a year. I'm like, man, you gotta do something wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we got paid eighteen five sixty, and but nonetheless, just joking aside, like he said that he lived off of a senior airman salary, which I can only imagine at that time was probably like twenty two, twenty four. So that every promotion he got after that would always go directly to savings, and him and his him and his wife budgeted that, and like so she kind of had some side gigs making extra money, and they and they kind of counted on that for some of their, you know, family adventures and stuff. But his salary increases, he would always got accustomed to living off of an E4 salary. So, and at that time he was getting promoted to tech. I think today he, he probably retired a senior or a chief master's or like an E9. 
But every step of the way, he got accustomed to living at one pay rate. So when he got pay raises based on his performance or increases in productivity or just time and grade, whatever, he was taking that excess and sticking it in savings. So, and like that mindset's like so powerful, right? Because he, he was still a pretty young guy, even as staff sergeant. And if he took that compounding interest number, even as a military guy, E3, E4, he probably could have retired a millionaire if he kept doing that. He pro- I don't know if he did. I haven't, I've unfortunately lost touch with him, but I'd be really interested to see if that's what happened because he had got it in his mind that that's how I'm going to budget. And that's so powerful, right? Because no matter what job you have, you're it started out as an entry level junk remover. You get used to living off entry level junk remover pay. Then you get promoted to driver then the crew chief then the lead technician, then the ops manager in training, then the ops manager. But the whole time that you were getting promoted, you were living off of a junk remover's pay. That's, that's crazy to think about. If you could get your mind switched on that way to live off of a entry level wage and then just tuck the rest of it away. I, to even add on that, I'm sure you're the, you were the same way. I bet when you joined the fire to become a fireman, you probably didn't know that you wanted to start junkyard or junk dogs or fire dogs. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and I think that's being able to save because you don't know what's coming get, allows you to have opportunities in the future to be able to start businesses or do side gigs or whatever the case might be. And that's, I think that's, that's the one unknown that is so important too to saving is I always believe that opportunity finds cash. And if you have cash sitting on the side, you'll find those opportunities like to start your business. Like my dad started his business and those types of things. Oh, that's good advice. Yeah, that's fire. Because, I mean, you set the money aside not knowing necessarily what it's for. Some of it's for financial planning, which we're getting ready to get into. But then, like, maybe 25, 26-year-old you is like, you know what? I'm going to go take a take a run at starting a, you know, landscaping business or whatever. Or buy rental properties, whatever right. it might be. Now you got the money to do it. Yep. That's cool. Um, this was kind of a warm-up episode. We just kind of wanted to wrap about, uh, you know, tips and tricks just some kind of takeaway aha moments, hopefully, for someone to kind of warm up to, to the next subject of our series, which is the five financial mistakes that firefighters commonly make when it comes to retirement. So now we're going to put on that firefighter hat, planning for retirement. The lessons will probably be applicable for anyone listening, but the subject of this article that I thought was powerful was it specifically to firefighters. Uh, so we're going to do that, take it one episode at a time. The first one in our series is lacking tax diversification. So... Audience, we will see you on the next episode. Take care. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Fire Producers Podcast. If you found value in today's episode, we please ask that you subscribe to our YouTube channel or consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast outlet. Take care, everybody.